All right, we are live. Good evening. I'm Eugenia Harvey, Chief Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Officer for the WNET Group, home of New York's 13, America's flagship PBS station, WLIW21, NJPBS, New Jersey's statewide public television network, and Long Island's only NPR station, WLIWFM, and, news and Newsroom, <clears throat> NJ Spotlight News. I'm also the executive producer for Chasing the Dream, a public media initiative examining poverty, justice, and opportunity in America. I'm so pleased to be here this evening to discuss Chasing the Dream's Power of a Pardon, a moving five-part original digital series produced by Jamila Paxima. It explores the profound question, how long is enough time to pay the price for one's crimes? The series traces the journeys of five formerly incarcerated individuals <clears throat> who've all served their time and who've learned that the only path to redemption and a chance to pursue their life's purpose is through the Pennsylvania Board of Pardons. While most states allow the serving a life sentence access to parole, that's not the case currently in Pennsylvania, where Dennis and Lee Horton, two brothers, spent nearly 30 years in prison for a crime they didn't commit. Despite their innocence and determination to better the prison institution from within, the Horton brothers' journey to pursue commutation is examined <clears throat> in their two-part story. We'll hear from Dennis and Lee tonight about how life-altering a pardon and criminal justice reform can be when trying to build life after prison. Stories like those examined in the power of a pardon are a hallmark of public media and the WNET group's mission. The WNET group and Chasing the Dream in particular are committed to presenting programming and <clears throat> initiating conversations that promote social justice and champion understanding through education. The work is made only possible through your support, including our donors who very generously contributed to our newly launched News and Public Affairs and DEI, <clears throat> excuse me, funds. With your help, we will find even more relevant and useful ways to serve and inform our nation, our community, and the next generation of public media audiences. We're pleased to bring you this preview of Power of a Pardon this evening and take <clears throat> a deeper dive into the topics addressed in the series. After tonight, I hope you will feel inclined to, to finish watching this powerful series, either on pbs.org slash Chasing the Dream or via the Chasing the Dream YouTube channel. And without further ado, I'll turn things over to the Honorable John Fetterman, Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania, to kick things off and tell us more about the work he's done during his tenure on the Pennsylvania Pardon, Board of Pardons. <clears throat> thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. And, and thank you, everyone, you know, on the panel for, for being here. And, and uh, as Lieutenant Governor of Pennsylvania, I'm, I'm uh, the chair of the Board of Pardons in Pennsylvania. And the only way those that are, were condemned uh, the life without parole in Pennsylvania have any chance at freedom is through the a commutation or those with a criminal record. The only chance they have to have their records cleared is through a pardon and all that has to come through through the board. And uh, I've been a fervent believer in the power of a second chance. Uh, I believe that the, the next wave, the next revolution in, in criminal justice reform in this country should come and could come in the way of, of pardons. The, the fact that you may have made a mistake through addiction or just a bad choice when you were young or you, you were engaged in a behavior that no longer is the person you are today, 10, 15 years, whatever later, and you're living your best life, but a, a record will quite literally follow you through the rest of your life, costing you better job opportunities, better housing opportunities, uh, better employment opportunities and all kinds of other things that really aren't fair, in my opinion, quite frankly. So uh, I'm proud to say that through our leadership, we've conferred more pardons in Pennsylvania than any administration in history. And there are two that I couldn't be more honored or humbled to be involved with than, than Lee and Dennis uh, tonight. They are two of the finest people that I know. And their story for me 
is a national model of emblematic of one, what's what's needs to be fixed in our criminal justice system here in America, and two, the finality of death by incarceration, and three, how important it is that we review these choices that were made in some cases up to half a century ago and really examine our people who they were decades ago made a bad decision or were involved, just involved in the decision. And I think you'll find that they aren't. And Lee and Dennis's case is extra extraordinarily uh, just difficult to process. Just the fact that they, they were actually innocent of the crime that they were convicted of and they managed to maintain themselves not only as model uh, inmates, but so much so that the actual warden of the facility believed in their innocence and actually pleaded and begged for their release. They're like, I would be delighted if these if these men lived next door to me. In fact, I'm taking them out to dinner if they ever uh, achieve freedom. And their strength and their resilience and their character is something that I aspire to to achieve one day. I wouldn't have lasted six months you know, in the ordeal that they did. And they emerged on the other end with a level of, of I, I can't even describe it, but uh, it, it is something that is uh, I'm most proud of to have been involved in my life. And uh, I'm so grateful to have them here with me, uh, with us tonight. So thank you. And hey, everyone, I apologize. My dogs are, of course, saying hi. They're big fans of Second Chances as well. Uh, my name is Celeste Trusty, and I'm political director for John's Senate campaign. And I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight for this truly special screening of parts one and two of the Brotherhood and Clemency installment of the Power of a Pardon docuseries. We, of course, want to thank WNET for their dedication to amplifying these really important stories in ways that are impactful. And of course, to the producer of the Power of a Pardon series, Jamila Paxima, who is gracious enough to join us on our panel tonight. And of course, we are also joined by John and Giselle Fetterman, and it is a true honor to have our comrades and our colleagues, Dennis Horton and Lee Horton here with us tonight. So Dennis and Lee Horton spent nearly 28 years in prison for a crime they did not commit. They were arrested, they were charged, and they were convicted of second degree or felony murder, which here in Pennsylvania carries a mandatory life without parole sentence. What happened to Dennis and Lee and in turn their family and our larger community is obviously an example of our legal system's failure. As John said, he's long championed the power of a second chance. And when he became chair of the Board of Pardons in Pennsylvania, he saw firsthand how random, arbitrary and punitive our legal system really was. His belief that everyone deserves justice is why he revolutionized and reinvented Pennsylvania's commutation and pardon system to give more second chance opportunities to our community members. The Power of a Pardon series tells the stories of these five formerly incarcerated community members here in Pennsylvania who have navigated their way through our legal system and were successfully granted clemency. So again, please take the time to watch all of the episodes in the series, share them with your friends, your networks, and help us tell these stories in such a powerful way. I promise you they're worth every single minute. So uh, before we go on to our panel, we're gonna watch episode one of the series on the Hortons. Being in prison is a, is a rough journey. Every day I had to hold on, I was slipping away. And my brother, thank goodness he was there, although I wish he wasn't there. We wound up in prison for 28 years for something somebody else did. A lot of people really struggle with getting back on their feet with criminal records. These records haunt them. We don't want to make it harder for people to find employment, to find housing. Um, you know, if we want to lower recidivism rates, these are the kinds of reforms that we need to be looking at. The more you drill down and you look at the, the, the nuts and bolts of the individual cases, I was horrified at how arbitrary and random some of these sentencings are. Most people who know me call me freedom. 
Wow, I've been pretty busy over the last 27 plus years, living on the inside um, in, in a prison, you know, in a cell. This is like my Samson locks. God gave him the strength to be able to overcome, to be able to fight against injustice. I had a, an epiphany that I wasn't gonna cut my hair anymore until I got out of prison. Sometimes I feel like I'm trapped in between the lines of a run on sentence. And we would just basically joyride, ride through the neighborhoods and decided to stop at his house. A prisoner of a misconceived parable. When he got into my car, the cops was actually following him. The cops pulled us over a couple of blocks away and they didn't want to hear it. They just took it like, okay, y'all are the guys. The words of my life spoken in past tense, dream, nightmare, sleep. We always professed our innocence. We made some bad decisions and poor choices in the people that we allowed in our company. And so here we are today. We spent 28 years trying to prove to the courts that we didn't murder anybody. And we were offered deals, but that would have meant going into court and lying. The horror, the horror of being accused of something that you didn't do, and the actual killer, the acknowledged killer, walked out of prison over 12 years ago. It's not justice. Most people in most states that are serving a life sentence have a parole eligible life sentence. Um, in Pennsylvania, it's the opposite. Most people serving life sentences in Pennsylvania have a life without parole sentence. So that means that it's really up to the pardons board and to the governor uh, whether or not those people will die in prison. Pages of yesterday shackle my tomorrows, minutes bleeding in between sorrows. I remember my grandmother saying, yeah, you shouldn't be here. You're just going to spend your time just being angry. Make a difference. Help somebody. All of what I was meant to be was stolen. Half of what I am is borrowed. My grandma, she just don't get it. <laughs> this was my thought process. She just don't get it. My flesh, my blood, my bone, my marrow. Pieces of a dream disappearing into the shadows. As the years went on, we began to realize that grandma is right. We can do something, you know what I mean, to make a difference in our lives and maybe other people's lives around us. They became my, two of my first facilitators for a wellness program that we were bringing to the department. I was a certified peer support specialist. Somebody who renders services to people who may be struggling with mental health issues. We were mentoring on the block. We were mentoring in the yard. We created an organization called Community of Men Molding a Safer Society. We created the first ever senior center inside of an institution. We was one of the first, I believe, ever inmate staffed crisis intervention uh, response team, a CERT team inside of a prison. I believe they are 100% innocent. They don't have it in them to harm another human being. So they became role models for other people. And I think that's what people saw. And that's why Lee and Dennis really um, were so successful with that. All rise. The December 20th, 2019 Pennsylvania Board of Pardons public hearing is now in session. You had the warden of the prison come to the hearing and say, these are the finest two inmates that we have in in our system. The warden of the prison said, I would be delighted to have them as my neighbor. How does it get any more crazy than that? I've known them for a long time now. There's no two people that should be commuted more than them two. 
when we got denied the first time on competition, it just felt to me like the courts, deja vu. When their case went down in December of 19, it marked one of the most awful moments of my, my life personally. And I made a vow that I, I'm getting these men to the governor's desk and I didn't care what that cost me. Crimson stains of what remained paint the sky sublime. Striations etched upon the winds of light record amber waves of time. Ebony hues of love imbued and pale hearts to hate the night. All of the rest was left behind. So before we get on to our discussion, I want to give a few just general uh, statistics about Pennsylvania's prison uh, population right now. So in 2020, 18% of Pennsylvania's total prison population was serving a life sentence. That includes life without parole, life sentences, and virtual life sentences. And in 2020, 33% of Pennsylvania's elderly prison population, which is people 55 and older, was serving life sentences. 62% of Pennsylvania's life sentence prison population in 2020 was black, despite black Pennsylvanians only comprising about 11% of the total state population. In 2020, 12% of Pennsylvania's over, overall prison population was serving life without parole sentences, which is the second highest rate nationwide. And as of se September 2020, Philadelphia's uh, Lawyers for Social Equity estimated Pennsylvania would spend around $1.76 billion to keep its current second degree life without parole population incarcerated. And 70% of the people serving life for felony murder here in Pennsylvania are black. So these statistics are so, so stark and we really, really need to make a difference here. So I'm so glad to have this conversation. So thank you so much for all being here again. So I wanna first start off this conversation with uh, Dennis and Lee. What were your lives like? I mean, I know the episode touched a lot about on this a little bit, but what were your lives like before you were arrested and incarcerated? And what was it like to be wrongfully accused and unjustly imprisoned uh, at such a young age, but also for such a long period of time? We'll go with Lee first. How's that? I, I mean, I can, I can start. I mean, I was married. I had four children. I had a wife. You know, I was looking at my future. I thought everything was going to be OK. And then, you know, the rug or the floor was snatched from up under me. And, you know, I mean, going to prison and being in prison, having never actually served time, anything like that. Being in prison was like a different world. It was like just the, the worst thing that could ever happen. And, you know, for a little while, you know, I went into a deep depression. I didn't, you know, I couldn't, I couldn't function well in the first, first, first year or two. I was pretty much like thinking like, you know, something has to change. This is going to rectify itself. The system must, be, I, I believed in the system. I thought it would work. You know, I had never been in the system, so I thought it actually would work. And he, we knew I was like a little naive in believing that one, any moment now, Somebody's going to figure this out and they're going to open the door and let my brother and I out. And it never happened. So but, yeah, I had a pretty good life. I mean, my wife and my children, you know, I have four beautiful children. I actually had a two week old baby at the time of my arrest and my incarceration. And that was the most the, the worst thing about being in prison was that, you know, I left my family. I was the primary uh, provider. You know, my wife, she was home. She was taking care of the children. And then when I left, they all pretty much went into like a, a, a struggle for life and death. And, you know, what made me depressed and had me in a depression was the fact that I couldn't be there to help. And, you know, and we were young. We were a young couple. And, you know, we thought we had the whole future in front of us. We had planned on sending our kids to private schools and raising them a certain way. And we had everything all planned out. And it just didn't it just didn't work out. And, 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 you know, I had actually applied to become a police officer at the time, which is the irony of that is that, you know, my, my wife got a letter from the, uh, from the police saying that I was accepted, you know, and, and, but by then I was being convicted. So it's like a contrast that's really crazy. But yeah, so that was, that was my life. My life was pretty good. You know, I just was looking towards the future thought I had, I was, we, I thought I was doing everything right. You know, I thought I was doing everything right, doing what I was supposed to do, you know, 
And it turned out, you know, that I wound up in prison. My best efforts to stay out didn't work. <laughs> right, and you know your story, and you know everything that you're saying really highlights the impact that incarceration and arrest in our legal system has on not just the person who's actually going through it, uh, who's actually being arrested and charged and convicted, but the family as well. Um, you know, you had to leave your four children and your wife, and you know, the impact of that we really do need to consider. I think as a society. Um, and so, Dennis, what about you? What was your life like before you were arrested and charged and convicted? Dennis, I think you might be muted. Am I good now? Yep. Okay, so you know, I, I was in my early twenties when um when we were arrested and convict and sentenced, you know, and uh, charged and uh, eventually convicted. But I want to go back just a little bit. Um, you know, uh, at eighteen years old, uh, of course, like you know, like most um, American kid, uh, young adults, I graduated high school and. You know, instead of going off to college, I opted to go into the workforce. You know, um, I come from a working class family, and um, that's what I, I chose to do. And um, you know, uh, I you know eventually I met you know uh, uh, someone special to me, and you know I got engaged, and uh, we, you know we were to be married. Um, you know, um, at that time that I was I was charged. Um, believe it or not, I, I just had hurt my leg on my job. You know what I mean? I, I injured my leg really bad and I had to, for which I had needed surgery for, you know, most people never knew this, you know what I mean? Um, so, uh, you know, fast forwarding it now. Um, so I, you know, we, again, we charged, um, we, you know, arrested, charged and eventually uh, convicted for this crime. And, um, I mean, it was, it was, um, I felt like I was in the twilight zone, you know, I felt like, you know, um, this was going to be straightened out. You know what I mean? I, you know, like Lee, um, you know, I grew up watching American movies, watching the court systems play out. And this was sadly, but this was my, my mindset thinking that this thing is going to work itself out. You know, um, it always does. I believe in the, in the American jurisprudence. This was my thinking, you know what I mean? You know, and like Lee, believe it or not, I also, I also applied to be a police officer. This is the, the irony of it, all this, you know what I'm saying? You know, um, you know, and I, w I wound up in prison. And it was one of the most difficult, you know, um, you know, times of my life. Um, you know, you know, like him, you know, I struggled with anxiety early on. Um, you know, I've never been in that, no situation like that. We've never been arrested and put in prison like that ever in our lives. So this was something new to us, and. You know, it was it was a roller coaster, you know, and it was very, very difficult early on. Thank you so much for sharing kind of what that experience was like early on. Um, I want to ask Jamila, you know, what prompted you to tack this tackle on this project of clemency in Pennsylvania, which is such a big story to tell. You could have told so many stories. What really made you want to tell this story specifically? And then also, what really drew you to Dennis and Lee uh, and their story specifically? Well, when I first started the power of the pardon, I was I was looking at the pardon process. That, uh, I was working with Brandon Flood, who's the secretary of the, the pardon uh, board. And I was really struck first by his story because Lieutenant Governor John Fetterman had appointed him to this position. It's the first time that I could find anywhere in this country that someone who believed that a formerly incarcerated individual could actually lead this office. And, um, and I, I was really interested in how they were gonna do some of their reform work. And so that's what initially got me interested. We decided to take a look at, here we are, it's almost December. Um, it was like last December's hearing, and we were going to take a look at some of the cases in there. And we weren't initially going to do a clemency case. And then um, during one of the hearings, the lieutenant governor was clearly distressed over the situation um, with the Hortons. And um, I, I was like, something's going on in this case that I don't know about, but I need to find out. <laughs> and so I kept inquiring and asking, and I actually had to go and persuade WNET 
to say like, there's a lot more going on here in this story. And I really think we need to do the Horton Brothers story in addition to these three other incredible stories of three ind other individuals who for more than 20 years have not been able to really live a life of full potential um, because of having a criminal background. They've served their time, but it's held them back in different ways. Some have, one has an immigration issue. The other is, is, is a woman who cleaned up her act from being uh, uh, involved with drugs and prostitution and um, really never really allowed herself to find another job except for the very first job she found walking out of prison. And um, and so and then there's Brandon Flood's story, which is really remarkable. So those are the three stories that I initially started. And then I'm, you know, I, I was trying to get to the Hortons and it wasn't really clear if when they were gonna get out um, and so forth and how I was gonna coordinate it all, but then it, it fell into place. And I kept hearing these like amazing, amazing stories about the way they were living inside the Department of Corrections. And they were at um, CSI Chester, which is one of the prisons that does a lot of reform work. And I just couldn't understand how they stayed so positive and outwardly focused and on other people through this entire ordeal. And that that got me very interested as well. And actually we have a great audience question from Pastor Harris. Hey, Pastor Harris. And that follows up really well with what Jamila was saying about your story. You know, Pastor Harris wants to know how Dennis and Lee maintained their sense of identity while unjustly imprisoned. And then we have another question to kind of follow up from that. Lori wanted to know how you both kept going, you know, especially during the times where things looked really bleak, where you didn't feel like there might be an option for relief, you know? Um, you know, how, tell us how that really impacted you and what that was like and how you really helped maintain hope, positivity, and your sense of self. Uh, Freedom, how about you? If I can, I'll take the second question. You know, how did I, you know, maintain a sense of self? Um, I got really one one answer for that, and that that was the fact that I was a um, a wellness recovery action plan um, facilitator. You know, being a, being that rat facilitator helped me immensely because it, you know it allowed me over the course of years to reflect on myself and you know what I mean, and and just do that work as, as far as keeping myself together. You know, especially during the, during the time of, you know, um, the commutation process or the clemency process, it was very difficult. I don't I don't think ha probably had I not been a rap facilitator, that means and basically, a, a, you know, a wellness recovery action plan facilitator. That means teaching people how to do a series of action plans for their lives to to, to basically, you know, help them create create a blueprint for living their best life every single day. And that's what I did for myself also, you know what I mean? You know, create a blueprint for living my best life every day. So that helped me when it was time to go through this commutation clemency process that was very di difficult, you know what I mean? Very trying, very, you know, um, just, you know, it seems like insurmountable mountains and, and, and cliffs and, you know, but that is what helped me keep it together, you know, among just, you know, previous to that, probably a lot of reading, a lot of just reading a lot of people's stories and particularly people, you know, uh, folks like um, um, Nelson Mandela, Long, a Long Walk to Freedom, you know, books like that, you know what I'm saying? Um, and just so many that uh, inspiring that, that helped me to, you know, to continue to maintain hope, also my family. Thank you so much. And Lee, how about you? Well, I mean, the, 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 like the first question, uh, how do we get through it? I think that our situation was new, unique. We had each other, like so many other guys that were in prison alone. We weren't alone. You know what I mean? My brother was there. So when I was having difficulties with the whole situation, I had somebody to talk to. I had somebody to help me get through it. And when he was going through something, I helped him get through it. So we was a support to each other. But like he said, we also had family. You know, we had we had a strong family. You know, our grandma told us pretty much don't go to the hole. You know, what I mean, we had a, our father was there. You know, what I mean, we had our father was there every step of the way from beginning to end. Our mother was a was a rock of Gibraltar for us. And, you know, we had people we had something to fall back on. We had support and that helped that helped immensely. But not only that, you know, uh, we're, we're not unique 
in the sense that there were a lot of men in the prisons that we went to that also supported us, that embraced us when they saw us. They knew we shouldn't be there and they began to give us help, to give us direction, to give us support. You know, they, they, they you know, they, they, they kind of coached us through, through the whole system until we became like them. You know, they, when we came in, you, with the work we was doing, that wasn't something that was unique. It was other guys doing that same work. And, and once we got on our feet and was able to function in, in the system, then, you know, we became like the men who were mentoring us. And that's when it was the, it was these older guys who had been in jail for 30 and 40 and 50 years, who was these mentors to us, who got you at the door and, and they showed you the ropes and they showed you how to make it through. And they and they and they helped you to not actually fall prey to the traps that are that is in the system or in prison that could cause you to have the worst record in the world. So, you know, we could take the credit, but I want to give the credit to where it's due. And it's the, the credit is due to those men who were, had come before us, who had been in prison, who didn't really have to do it, but stepped up and they showed us the way and they helped us every step of the way. And they gave us the pointers and the direction and the mentorship for us to become the men we became because we might have just fell apart. You know, if we didn't have that guidance and have that support, we might have just fell apart. But yes, my brother and I, we had each other. We had our family and we also had the men that was around us, those those old heads, as you would if you would have called them that the old heads that were serving life sentences and long term sentences and had those long had been in prison for long periods, of time, seen it all and done it all and, and showed us what we didn't have to do. And that was pretty much, you know, one of the main things that got us through. I think you make a beautiful point here in showing that there are so many people in prison who are incredible mentors, right? You know, prison walls are meant to keep us out uh, and also keep people in, right? But when you go in and actually meet people who are incarcerated, right, you see that so many of them are just like us and they want to do good. They want to do right. They want to mentor and give back. And so thank you so much for giving that credit to the mentors who came before you. And also thank you so much, Freedom and Lee, for being those mentors for the younger folks who are coming into the prison. So I really do want to thank you so much for that. Um, I also want to ask John, you know, as Pennsylvania's LG, you know, being the chair of Board of Pardons, it's historically kind of been, you know, overlooked um, as a role that the LG has played and kind of, you know, under uh, underutilized as a way to really make a difference on reform. So what makes you as a person and a politician so passionate about clemency reform? And when you found out about the Hortons and their decades long str struggle for freedom, you know, why did you go so hard to advocate clemency for them specifically? I mean, uh, I've, uh, I've always had a longstanding personal belief that uh, second chances are, are critical. And, you know, uh, the redemption or forgiveness underpins every major world religion. The theme of 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 imperfection uh, and mistakes, and and moving towards forgiveness and redemption, and and uh, I would see people whose lives were kneecapped or for, you know you know limited by a decision that they made, you know a, a bad choice or whatever, and this record would follow them for for the rest of their life, and it's an incredible power to have to be able to you know give somebody a, a completely fresh start and a, and a clean slate. And, and that, to me, it needs to be expanded and, and made part of our criminal justice system uh, en masse, in my opinion. We, in Pennsylvania, spend $3.2 billion on the punishment part, but we spend a little over a million dollars on the redemption and the second chance. That is a grotesque mismatch of resource and focus, if you want to ask me. And the point of the matter is it makes folks better citizens. It makes them better parents. It makes them better partners and neighbors and workers and, and everything. And it's, it's really a win-win for everybody. If you're living your best life and you no longer remotely resemble the individual that made that mistake or made that bad choice, why should you pay for that for the rest of your life? And, you know, Lee and, Lee and Freedom's case really for me is, is the, the pinnacle of what's fundamentally broken and wrong in, in our system here in Pennsylvania. But there's been a lot of individuals that, that, have advocated for that we're able to get a second chance. And, and I'm so grateful for the partner that I have in Governor Wolf, because ultimately it's his pen that once we get it to his desk, uh, you know, that that provides that that final st step of relief. But, you know, I, I for me with Lee and Dennis, um, 
I can't imagine the horror of there being a, you know, for anyone watching this tonight, a knock at your door, you're arrested, taken to prison and accused of doing something terrible. And you are away from your family for nearly the next three decades. I can't imagine what that would do to me personally. I have a brother approximately the same age gap as, as Lee and Freedoms. And I can't imagine if he and I were, were swept up and had that happen to me. And Giselle and I, we have two boys, uh, you know, and I couldn't imagine having them ripped from us for something that they didn't do. And in, in Lee and Freedom's first hearing before the, the board, their father testified before, and uh, I could see the, the, the uh, utter pain and anguish in his eyes, and he was pleading for his, for, for his son's freedom. And, and uh, it, it, it hit me in a way that I can't fully articulate. And, um, and, and this was, he followed a series of other witnesses from the warden and everyone else in DOJ. I mean, Lee and Dennis never had any interaction with the criminal justice system other than applying to be police officers, you know, as a juvenile or as adults or anything. And they had flawless, flawless prison records. Not, not you know, and I, I haven't had a flawless, I've had speeding tickets, I've had infractions, you know, in my life. So I, I said, my plea was, you know, either either these men have been perfectly faking their entire lives or they're innocent and the system has gotten it horribly wrong and it, we are the only people that can put this terrible wrong right. And their case was something that I refuse to let go because um, it, it is, you know, and I always made peace with the fact that if I don't do anything, you know, in my political life, or, you know, public life, again, other than you know, help get them to where they deserve and they should have always been, then I, I'll be okay with that because uh, they, they are extraordinary people and and uh, I can't or anyone can give back what they've lost, but I, I sure hope they're able to to make uh, and have been and they've been making an enormous contribution since they've been on the other side. Yeah, and I want to just quickly go over, you know, some of these statistics about what's happened um, under your leadership here at, uh, on the Board of Pardons uh, in the last two years. So in the last two years since you've taken over as chair, the number of pardon applications heard by the board has increased by 104 percent. And in those last two years, the number of pardon requests recommended to the board, or recommended by the board, has increased by 69%. And the number of life sentence commutation requests recommended to the governor by the board has increased by 1,200%. Percent. These are individuals' lives, like Freedom and Lee here. And when we actually have somebody, you know, over the board who's committed to reform, we see major, major change. So again, thank you, John, so much for all of the work you've done here on the board. And I really want to say that, like, these things are so important for long-term change. And the more we can really advocate to have more people in power who care about this and fight for this, the better off we all are. So we also have another uh, audience question I'm going to ask to John. You know, it's a, so they want to know after you're done on the board, what can our audience members, our community members do to really help ensure that the board continues on this path after you're no longer the chair? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, uh, I really, my hope, my, my, you know, and I want to be clear if, if there was some way constitutionally for me to do this for the rest of my life, I, I would. You know, you, they always, your guidance counselor says, you know, do what you would do for free and make that your career. And, and I would I would do this honestly for the rest of my life because there's there's been such a backlog of bad judgments and bad cases and and injustice. And before we impose the ultimate penalty, and that is dying in prison, we really need to make sure that this is really what justice demands and really how appropriate that punishment was ever in the first place. You know, something that I really want to emphasize, the acknowledged killer and the person that was responsible for this crime was released in prison in 2008. You know, I, I, I to me, I'm only speaking for me, the hardest time I could have done would have been after the killer, the one that actually did this, that everyone agrees from the police and everyone did it, is out. And I'm in here on a technicality is, is, is injustice stacked on an already enormous injustice. So 
So for, from my perspective, advocating for this, this kind of second chance, it's like, you know, there isn't the hardest heart individual, uh, no matter how tough on crime, if you spent a half an hour around these brothers and listened to their story and listened to the kind of lives they led, you wouldn't live, you wouldn't look at them and look at this system here in Pennsylvania and say, you know, we really need to make a change here, you know, and, um, and I hope it continues, but, but, um, uh, you know, the fact that these men and women now that are out and taxpayers, you know, even if you don't care about the justice and the humanity here, you know, the fact that we're not spending $50,000 a year warehousing individuals until they die uh, or more is, it, it just makes no sense at any level. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, honestly, I want to also talk about the fact that since you've been the chair, uh, you know, the board has actually granted 63 public hearings for people who were sentenced to life. And that is more than all of the Pennsylvania lieutenant governors over the last 26 years combined. So, again, I want to re reiterate the fact that we need to be making sure that we're putting people in power who do fight for these things because there are real world, world uh, tangible outcomes. If you just look at Freedom and Lee and what they've been able to do since they've been home, you know, this really does matter. So now I want to go ahead and show the second part of this docuseries, the episode on uh, the Horton brothers. And please enjoy this next segment. We wound up in prison for 28 years trying to prove to the courts that we weren't the guys. Think about the board of pardons. They're going to make that determination based on who you are. Are you ready to come back in society? Would you be a threat? Should you be given that second chance? Everybody's not going to be given that second chance. And some people ought not to be given that second chance. A lot of people really struggle with getting back on their feet with criminal records. These records haunt them. We don't want to make it harder for people to find employment, to find housing. Um, if we want to lower recidivism rates, these are the kinds of reforms that we need to be looking at. The fact that Pennsylvania saw these men as disposable and throwaway, like, I don't know how we could ever get to that point. We fought every single day, every single week. We never gave up, you know, all the way up until the current day, we still fight. The pages of yesterday shackle my tomorrows, minutes bleeding in between sorrows. All of what I was meant to be was stolen. Pieces of a dream disappearing into the shadows. Horton Brothers had no previous criminal history. You had a statement from the principal in the case who, while he didn't outright say they weren't there, he didn't say that they were. In any situation, I would trust both of them with my life. When they started going to the facility, they started to see a decrease in people needing to go into restrictive housing. Anytime that it was needed for them to go and talk to somebody, um, sit with somebody, uh, cry with somebody. We're starting to see them talk people out of suicide. I believe that they have the ability to reach so many others that I'm not able to help. Could you gentlemen describe their misconduct history in prison zero 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 misconducts in 
well over 50 years of collective incarceration, zero misconduct. The file indicates that they have a score of zero when it comes to the reoffending uh, assessment. In my time as Lieutenant Governor and Board Chair, I have actually never seen a, a score of a zero. It's unheard of, correct. They just don't belong in prison. They've lived their lives like innocent, nonviolent men, helping others at all times, even before themselves, they, they help others. Um, you just don't find that in, in prisons. Anything can happen here. You've seen, especially in the 11th hour, The Bumblebee bears witness to what the Mockingbird can never forget. Miss Grayson? Yes. Mr. Gubernick? Yes. Shaky souls pull triggers slaying axioms of history. General Shapiro? Yes. Governor? I am also a yes. Duly noted, application recommended. They voted for my brother and everybody jumped up and down and started screaming and hollering and I was screaming and hollering at first and then I said, hold it. They didn't vote for me yet, so they didn't, everybody calmed down and sat back to say, oh yeah, that's right. I will now call for a vote. Ms. Grayson. Yes. Mr. Gubernick. Yes. General Shapiro. I'm a yes, and I, I think the Lieutenant Governor is a yes as well, so I'll vote for him if that's okay. Duly noted. Governor with the Thank you. Attorney General is as your proxy. Yes. Application recommended. My legs got wobbly and, you know, it, it felt like a building was taken off my shoulders. I was elated. Only until uh, Lieutenant Governor Fetterman started voicing his opinion about believing in us, more people started paying attention. That made the difference. Lynn, how you doing? Oh, hey. <laughs> hey, guys. <laughs> Look Me, at every, the trees. Everything oh. is bright. I'm just happy to see you guys here. Right, right. So yes. set it behind the walls. That's the main thing. I think we'll be helping to train people to help people. The Fetterman campaign reached out to us and asked would we like to come on board and to organize support for his um, Senate bid. It's going to be a part-time position. They're not innocent. They simply have had their sentences commuted. They will be under parole supervision, at least as of uh, right now, for the remainder of their life. Until which time, uh, if they decide to put in to commute their parole or to put in for a pardon to relieve themselves of the conviction altogether. At the Sentencing Project, we advocate for ending life imprisonment completely and limiting prison terms to 20 years. The Horton brothers shor shortly are going to be able to hug their relatives and their family and their father. That means everything. Every time I come out the halfway house, I spend my time with her. I'm standing right with him from the moment he got out of prison. Our future is going to be bright. Let the dreamers keep their eyes on the prize while the gorillas grab full clips. Freedom is not free, it's the price of. Want to see reform of, you know, of life without parole. You know, we should never throw anybody in prison and say that they can't change, that they shouldn't be given a second chance. That's not who we are. At least that's not who we're supposed to be as Americans. We've been striving all our life to make an impact on society and to some degree to prove the system wrong, to prove that you got it wrong. Look at us. We're not the guys who you said we were. We are two men who found our purpose in life.
All right. So I cried the entire way through, as I usually do when we hear that part of the story. So um, Jamila, also, thank you so much again for being able to show their story and share their story in such a powerful way through this visual medium. Um, so Dennis, as they mentioned in the episode, your case was heard first during this Board of Pardons hearing when you were about to be hopefully supported for clemency. Can you even begin to put into words how it felt to wait and then to actually hear that yes vote whenever they had your name up? Just, let me just say this, word, I can't even put it into words because I, you know, I, I was just so overjoyed and, and just, you know what I mean? And, and just so thankful and grateful for all the people that supported us. You know what I mean? All that just, I just felt all that emotion just come rushing, you know what I mean? Um, rush the emotion for, for my family, you know, for my mother, you know, that was no longer, you know, there with us. Um, you know, just, just, um, of course, you know, for the Lieutenant Governor, I mean, you know, I, I don't think people get it, you know, you know, John Fetterman, you know, saved our lives without, without John Fetterman, we, we are still in prison and we died there. I'm, I'm just, I gotta be honest, you know, with everyone who's here paying attention, with, you know, without him, we die in prison. The court system failed us every which way. We went up and down the court system, maybe, I don't know how many times to our lost count. That's how many times I, I, I can't even count. But with him, he saved our lives, single-handedly saved our lives. And, and you know, I was, I was overjoyed with emotion you know, for the support that he gave us, for the fight that, you know what I mean, you know, for not giving up on us. It would have been so easy for him to just walk away in 2019 when and said, hey, hey, guys, I gave it my best shot. Not him. He didn't do that. He dug in even hard, even even more and fought even harder. And 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 we owe a, 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 a gratitude, you know what I mean, to him you know, for sticking in there and fighting for our lives. And that's, and, and, and all that emotion that, you know, that I, I, you know, I let out, you know what I mean? Was for all that, for all those, those folks who fought tirelessly, you know what I mean? For my mother who, like Lee said, she was, she was a rock of Gibraltar that stuck by us from day one. My grandmother, my father, you know what I mean? My siblings, you know, and all the other supporters that came along the way. But that, that you know what I mean? That was the motion. Motions that I let out was for all those reasons. And Lee, how about you? I mean, describe what it was like for you. I know you mentioned this a little bit in the episode, but your brother was first, right? And of course, what was it like to feel that knowing that your brother was supported, but they hadn't voted on you yet, you know? and knowing that there was still this little bit of unknown, you know, how did that feel? And then of course, how did it feel when they heard, when you heard that you had the necessary votes to be supported? Well, I mean, when they, when I, when I, when I heard my brother had it, I mean, it was like, you know, the best feeling ever because I definitely wanted him to go home. And even if, if, if I didn't, if I, if I wouldn't have gotten it at the time, I knew that my brother going home was half the battle. And that 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 would have gave me all the hope in the world that one day I would be walking out too. But when they said that I had it, I almost passed out. I'm not even gonna fake no games. I almost I almost slid out the chair and onto the floor. And you know, I felt as though it was a miracle because I would we would we went down there in our minds believing that it was just for us, it was just a, a formality, that we were just going down there to be told that we were not going mm -hmm. to get it. And you know, and I and I want to thank the staff of SCI Chester who gave us so much support and, and the men in the institution. Mm -hmm. You know, when I when we didn't get it the first time, a part of the disappointment wasn't in the fact that we didn't get it, wasn't it was in that so many of the men had put hope in us getting it. And it felt like we had let them down, you know, because guys were saying, if you can't get it, why should I even try? And so for us to get it, it gave a lot of men hope. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that that night that we would recommend it was the first night, I think, in the whole time I was in prison that I actually slept. 
You know, I never slept a full, I never slept through a full night in the whole entire time I was in prison, I think, until that night. And, you know, and just to be able to call, you know, my wife and like my brother said, my family, we have we have been fighting to come home for so many years and gave them so many and so many times we thought it was going to be it with the courts and things like that. And it wrote, wrote, it ra- rose, they raised their, their, uh, uh, their expectations so high just to let them down. And then I was finally, I had an opportunity to call home and say, you know, cause my wife and them, they didn't even want to watch the stuff. They, they she said she couldn't do it. And to be able to call home to tell her that we were recommended and that I would be coming home. And, you know, that was the, like the best thing in the world. And, and to really like, you know, my father could just like rest, you know, because I know that he had so much on him and, you know, for us to come home, he wanted us to come home so badly. And, you know, and he and, and I, it just for him to rest is for him to sit back and just be not have to think about us being in prison or the anxiety of trying to help us to get out and all of that and, and, and not feeling like he did something wrong. He often told us, what did he do wrong that, you know, he couldn't get it, keep, get it, keep, get us out of prison. So, so it was just a wonderful feeling, but to me, I, I say it today, as I said it then, to me, it was like a miracle. Yeah. Now, thank you so much for sharing that experience with everybody. I can't even imagine because I remember how emotional I was at hearing the decision. So I can't even imagine what it was like for you and also everybody else inside of the prison who then felt that feeling of hope. Um, you know, for themselves as well. So John, how did it feel for you? I mean, I think we all know, we all saw the video uh, right now, but how did it feel for you when Dennis and Lee finally got the required votes for the board support? I mean, you could barely get the words out when it was your turn to vote. So how did that feel for you? Yeah. Uh, before before the, the, the public meeting, there's executive session where the cases are, di- are discussed and, and you know where the votes are going to come before. And, and uh, I want to acknowledge and, and express my gratitude to the members of the board that, that eventually came around and voted. I'm forever in their debt for, for seeing it, you know, the, 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 the value in, in moving forward with this case. The board requires an, a unanimous decision. You know, with five members, a four to one is as big of a of a letdown as zero to five there that means they still can't get to the governor's desk and when i realized that in the executive session that we would have a unanimous vote i i lost my i I wasn't able to maintain my composure i actually had to log off and and because i was i was just so um overcome because this was something that really mattered to me at, at a level that um because this was their last chance. I mean, the president of the United States, the governor, no one could have gotten, you know, these folks out, but through the board, you know, and, and this was their, their last, their last chance, you know, they wouldn't have gotten another chance, you know, until if ever, but certainly not when I was Lieutenant governor anymore at this point. And so it was as high as stakes of a, of a scene as, as you can imagine. And uh, knowing that I, I just uh, were overcome with everything that they missed out on and everything that they lost. And um, and it was uh, it was it was overjoyed. I, you know, my career could have ended, you know, that afternoon when when the votes were, were tallied and I'd have been OK with that just because, um, you know, there there were enough things that were have been so wrong that were put right that day. It wasn't just. Lee and Freedom that that got the votes. There were a lot of other individuals that day that got their votes and sent to the governor's desk too. And and um, you know I, I uh, you know it, it just it just means everything. And and uh, I uh, you know the the people that really deserve the credit are are, are Lee and Freedom themselves. You know uh, like you know I can look at someone and say there's no way I could do what they did. You know and and I could never have endured 28 years of wrongful incarceration away from my family and everything that I knew and loved for something that I didn't do. And I, they, they were offered a, a sweetheart deal. They had, just plead guilty and you'll be out in four to in four to 10. And they didn't take that deal because we're innocent men. Why would we plead guilty for something that we didn't do? And uh, so, uh, yeah, I, 
there isn't a day that goes by that I, I won't see their picture or think, you know, um, and I, in fact, you, you know, you, uh, I'll never forget, you texted me a selfie of, of them, you know, uh, when they really were out for the first time, getting to buy clothes for the first time in nearly three decades, wearing clothes that didn't come from the Department of Corrections. And, and it's, it's, it's one of my most cherished pictures. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I mean, if it was that for me and you, I can't even imagine what that was like for their families and, and, and for them themselves. This case was such a big part of our family at home. We have three kids who would ask, are they out yet? Like they knew <laughs> Lee and Freedom by name and they would regularly ask for updates. I mean, it was such a, it took over a, a big part of our life because we were all so committed to, to seeing them home. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is also important. I want to switch over to Jamila now, and I'd love to hear kind of you know, your thoughts on the role of the media in amplifying these types of stories and how you think storytelling can really uh, be used to help shift narratives, change hearts and minds, and really advance more productive discussion around the need to transform our legal system. I mean, this is why I, I work in this business every day, because I think it's um, we have an obligation to really listen to people and 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 look at look at the evidence in front of you, of who these two men w were and are in prison, what they have been able to accomplish, and um, offer other human beings. I mean, this to me at the end of the day, this is such an amazing symbol of humanity on every level. Um, and I I I also get really emotional over this story because. I just can't, um, I remember when I, I called SCI uh, Chester one day and I, I was trying to figure out when they were going to get out. Cause I was like, I have got to figure out how to get a shot of them leaving. And <clears throat> uh, you know, us reporters, we have our little sneaky ways of trying to figure these things out. And, and they were like, it's just not going to be the normal way because they're, you know, they're going to a halfway house. I can't tell you where it is a secret and all this, but even the people who are answering the phone were like, I don't know what we're going to do. We are going to miss them. They keep this place sane. They keep this place calm. Um, I'm just like I just never even imagined that you could hear something like this within within the system. But I feel like it is it is the media's job to keep prying and to keep pressing and and um, to reveal these stories. And and I also ask people to be courageous and tell them like it. The last thing you want is is a camera person and a documentarian and their crew in your life when you haven't had your family around you for 30 years. I mean, you know, like, can I please be with you just for some of these new experiences um, and sort of see the, how you're going to enter this new world? And, um, you know, first I thought I, I just want to do this short series, you know, with the Horton brothers but I'm like so hooked on what, who they are all about and what they are yet to do. I mean, the, the potential of humanity that these two men have and what they have still can do with what's remaining in their life is now what I am so interested in. Um, and that they're, they're, that they, they don't make their choices for themselves, but it is always outwardly focused. And I think that just teaches us a lot um, in this time where we're very conflicted politically in this world, that actually, if we just take the time to sit and listen and talk, we might actually see each other in completely different ways and just blow up all these stereotypes that have put people like them in prison unnecessarily. And I think you really do make a great point. You know, we've all needed mercy at some point in our lives. You know, we've all needed redemption and forgiveness. And we're human beings. You know, I'm certainly not the same person I was when I was 25. Right. We all have the ability to change and grow. And I think Freedom and Lee did a great job at really talking earlier about the people who were inside prison, who had been there for a while. Right. And their roles in the prison community, they helped really prop up that society. You know, and I think it really does show the amazing uh, qualities that Freedom and Lee have when the prison staff is saying, we're really going to miss them so much. And I remember the first time I went in to SEI Chester and was able to meet Freedom and Lee, and I was just blown away again by how wonderful they were. You can actually feel it right? When you go near them. And I'm sure everybody mm -hmm. on this panel who's actually met Freedom and Lee, it's the truth. They radiate this like 
wonderful joy and calm, um, which is, of course, so different than what a lot of the media does portray about people in prison. So I really think it's so important that these stories are told in a powerful way to highlight the people that are being impacted. So again, Jamila, thank you so much for all of the work that you've done to really share these stories. I want to acknowledge also George Trudell, who's here watching in the comments. Hey, George, mm -hmm. he's another wonderful commutation recipient. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure that I said hello to George. Um, you got to say hi too then. <laughs> What's up, George? <laughs> hey. hey. I got to just say this. George was definitely a help to us. And he's one of those, He, even I think I might be older than him, but he's one of those old heads that helped us to get through a lot and gave us guidance and things like that. And, you know, in, in the earlier, uh, the first part, I said, we a lot, we created this and we create, our, I hope people don't make the mistake of believing that I'm referring to my brother now. When I say we, I'm talking about all of those men, all of those men who we left behind, who were a part of everything we did, who all wanted, we collaborated and we worked together and, you know, they were also those men that kept the place calm and sane and, and safe. You know, I always tell people Pennsylvania has some of the safest prisons in the world. It's not it's not because of the staff, no knock to the staff. It's because of the men who've been in those prisons who re are reformed, rehabilitated. And, you know, they don't want they, they want to see something different. Yeah. And so, Lee, I want to stay with you. What was it like when you came home? Right. And you were able to see your wife, who is lovely, by the way. Hi, Joanna. And your four children for the first time outside of prison walls in nearly 30 years. What? I don't even think I can comprehend what that would be like. Can you just explain to us what that was like? If anybody here, maybe I may be older than a lot of people, but uh, if you remember It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart, and 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 he and he's he's lost for a while, and he's out there, and he and he wants to get away, and then all of a sudden he comes home. That's how it felt coming home to all your the people that love you, and to be away for so long, and 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 just to be able to embrace them and sit down and talk. I think when I came home, my my wife and I we must have talked for like two or three days. You know, what I mean, I had unlimited phone access, so we was on the phone. I was talking all the way to the house. We talked when I got to the house. He kept talking clear into the night and I, on my way back to the halfway house, we were still talking on the phone and, you know, to be around my children who are no longer children. They, they, they're all in it. They, they, my, oh, my youngest is 28 years old, 29, going on 29, 30, uh, 30, 32 and 33. So I have I have older children. I have my, my, my grandchildren. You know, I got a chance to embrace my grandchildren and just to, you know, to, just to hang out with my father and see my sisters who were also two soldiers for us and my sister Tamika, you know, who, who pretty much was our big sister for the first few days. She's our youngest sister, but she was like our big sister for the first few days we were out, a few, a few weeks we were out. And my, 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 my brother Keith, who was magical, came and just picked us up and drove us all over the place. And, you know, and he, it was for him, it was like, we never had left. And, you know, uh, but it was just, this this just wonderful. And, 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 you know, and, and even seeing a lot of the guys who were in, who came by to see us at the halfway house to thank us and to, to, to see what they could do for us, to see that they're carrying on what we were doing to, to help them. Now they're here, they are to help us. And it's just, it just was, you know, just a wonderful experience coming home. Mm, mm, mm. So, and then Freedom, how about you? What was it like? I mean, you have a twin sister, right? So what was it like when you got home or were able to spend that time with your twin sister, with the rest of your siblings, your family? It was, it was so wonderful um, because, it, and like Lee said, it was, it was like I never left my twin sister. You know what I mean? I mean, I, yeah, I do have a twin, you know, and when I, when I left, you know, I, I used to, I remember before I left, I used to be the boss. When I came back, she was the boss. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's amazing how, the, you know, the world evolves and things change. And like, you know, um, I was the big brother, you know, by two minutes, you know, but I flexed all the time when we were younger. But when I came back, she was the big sister and she flexed, you know, but it was just so wonderful to spend the time with my family and just like Lee said, unlimited time and just, just so thankful and just so grateful and just, you know, 
you know, I, it just it felt so good. You know what I mean? My pop still calls me right now to this day. Hey, man, where's my 15 minutes at? <laughs> you know what I mean? I want my 15 minutes. And I say, all right, pops, I got I got to make I got to make room for it. No matter how hard I'm working or whatever, I got to stop and make room for 15 minutes for him. You know what I mean? Even though in his 15 minutes I always turn into two hours, you know, and there's no talking to him 15 minutes. Everything is two hours with him. You know what I mean? But I love it and I enjoy talking to him and I enjoy just brightening his day up every single day. You know, so I'm so listen, I'm just I'm I'm so grateful and just so so thankful to be home and just spending all this time with all my siblings. I I go by their houses and sit and, and converse with them and you know what I mean? It's just a, it's just so wonderful. And I'm just again grateful and thankful. And so we have a question from our audience member, Joe Schwartz, who actually was uh, granted clemency from President Obama in 2016. So congratulations on that and welcome home. He wants to know how Dennis and Lee are adjusting to their return and how their experience shapes the lives that you have today. How about freedom? You go first. Um, my my family, my family and supporters made it so, so much easier. You know what I mean? And I understand, you know, and the thing about it is when Lee and I was, you know, on the inside, we created a, um, a reentry program and we created that program because we wanted to help men who were soon to be leaving prison, you know, get everything they need so they can make a smooth adjustment when they get out there and they can succeed. So we pretty much just took, took that advice of ourselves that we would, you know, that we were facilitating in, in programs and classes and, and we applied it to our own lives. You know what I mean? Family support, we allowed that family support. You know, we didn't, you know, we didn't run away from it. You know, we allowed support from, you know, from friends and, and other people. You know what I'm saying? You know, um, you know, we definitely, uh, you know, allowed the support from the Lieutenant Governor, you know, who hired us. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, and that helped us to make, you know, a smooth adjustment, you know, so all those things. My father, of course, he was very instrumental. You know, when we got out, you know, he was there every second, every step of the way, making sure we had all the basic things that we needed, you know what I mean, to make that, that smooth transition. You know, and of course us, you know, we, we're going to keep fighting and we're going to keep talking about those men and women on the inside that are deserving of a second chance that helped us to make it through. You know what I mean? You know, these these individuals helped us to make a, tr a smooth transition by the support and all the things that they helped give us on the inside. You know, so when we was out out that we out here now, this is what we do. We try to advocate on their behalf, on the on the fact that we are not unique. They're no different than us. If given an opportunity, they will come out here and be a part of helping to make society safer. That's so true. And, you know, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, you know, we have another audience member named Lon, and he asked about stories of people who have been granted clemency for things like old weed charges and the positive impact that a pardon can have on people's lives. So, John, can you explain a little bit further about the expedited review pr program that you put in place with the Board of Pardons uh, for people with marijuana convictions and just kind of let us know how that program's going? Sure. It, it, it uh, you know, uh, marijuana is a is a is a plant that's used by a, a lot of people and we know now over decades and decades of records and law enforcement uh arrests that it disproportionately impacts you know black and brown folks in those communities and and um more and more states and jurisdictions are either legalizing it outright or decriminalizing it and in pennsylvania we're behind on on that angle we uh, arrest and or charge 20,000 of our residents every year with, with a marijuana conviction or charge that is just, in my opinion, nonsensical. So we wanted to free people from their record of a drug felony or some of these records that, that damage, if not outright destroy their lives. Um, you know, you and I were, were at, at that national conference in Washington, D.C., and remember that woman that came up and, and, and gave us a hug because she got her pardon. She was at dental school at the University of Pennsylvania, the best dental school in the, in the country. And she caught a weed charge and she was forced to drop out because she would never be able to hold a medical license again because she got caught with, with an eighth of an ounce of marijuana, you know? And she said she was crying and she was like, for the first time in my life, I don't have to check that box anymore. 
and she's free. And it makes me desperately sad for what she's lost, what our society has lost, a dentist, a medical professional, because of an eighth of an ounce of marijuana. Like it, also it's, a mom who was never able to yeah, be in the PTA or volunteer in her child's school. So, so we've expedited it to, it's from the time you get your application into a couple months, you know, we can get that off your record. Everyone on the board uh, agrees, or majority, including the attorney general agree that it, this doesn't make sense. We need to rectify that, you know, but, uh, but, but, you know, what, what, what Lee and Dennis have, have been through, uh, I, I think is, I hope that's an example that can reach as many people as possible, because um, if you can spend any amount of time with these gentlemen and think that, that their lives should have just been like, well, whatever, you know, I mean, like, you know, we're doing this in mass in, in throwing away these, these, these lives. Um, and, and in some cases they're, they're innocent. And, you know, like, why wouldn't we be really, really sure before we impose this, this, this penalty? And, and um, I, I still haven't gotten used to them being out, quite frankly, you know, and, and it's just, it's something that I never take for granted because um, I, I am preoccupied with, with um, just, you know, I, I, they're just such extraordinary people. And, and, uh, I marvel at their strength and their humanity and their resilience every time I, I see them. And, and they genuinely inspire me because um, it, it would be like if you watch somebody lift 2000 pounds and you're like, how, how do they do that? I could never do that. It's like what they did emotionally, physically, spiritually, uh, you know, I, I just could have never, never done that. And, and um, you know, you know, we, uh, you get outraged if you're bumped off your flight and like, what, I, this is an outrage. But to be wrongfully imprisoned and labeled, uh, you know, for nearly 30 years and to be taken from your family, I, I can't even process that. Yeah, I mean, I think most of us can could never, right? We could never even put ourselves in a situation where we could imagine what Freedom and Lee have had to go through. And so, you know, again, Freedom and Lee, thank you so much because I am also not used to you being home. Every time I see you, it's a miracle. Every time I get a text from you, it's a miracle. You know, Lee sends out good morning texts to a whole bunch of people every morning. And seeing that every morning is something that I will never forget. I never take for granted. Um, and so it's so wonderful to have such incredible community members home with us. And so again, thank you so much for being here and lending your time and expertise to this conversation. Um, so I wanna talk about something else that's really important about second chances that I think is often overlooked in this discussion. And that's the fact that Dennis and Lee, you were able to vote for the first time in 28 years this year, um, you know, you were removed and disenfranchised from being able to, to participate in the political process with your vote for all of that time because you were serving life without parole. What did it feel like? I know you were so politically involved while you were inside of prison, but what did it feel like to be able to come home, go into the voting booth and actually cast a vote for the first time this year? Well, for me, it felt like, you know, I had a voice. Like I had, I had no voice for all those years, you know, like I was, I was muted, you know, often I'm on Zoom and people will say, you're mute, you're on mute. And, you know, that's how I felt when I was in prison, I couldn't vote and I would see it, I paid attention and I, you know, I, I would want to be there to vote for the right person. You know, I always thought people were voting and then the wrong person would get in and I would think that if I could have voted, maybe I could have helped to put the right person in office. And, and, it, and it made me feel like I'm a part of the country. Like, you know, our brother always talks about us being Americans. You know, it was a time when we used to have, me and him used to have vicious debates in there because I would be like, we're not being treated like Americans. I'm not, I don't want to, but at the end of the day, he's right. You know what I mean? You have a right to vote and, and you want to be heard. And, and, you know, you shouldn't take that vote lightly. And so me walking in there, it felt like, you know, I'm finally a whole citizen. I'm finally, you know, I have value. You know, that that's what it felt like to me. Like I have all this value now that and, and then it made me feel like, I, you know, I have the ability to make change, not just talk about it, to actually really affect change. And Freedom, how about you? Oh, I salivated at the opportunity to one day get out of prison and be able to vote because I understood the importance of it. And, that, you know what I mean? I, inst I understood that, that, you know, the sacrifices so many people made, you know what I mean? You know, yes, you know, 
are, are you know our service people they go abroad they fight they you know what i mean they hold it down for us you know what i mean folks at home fight and struggle hold it down for us to be able to have that opportunity you know the founders who created this you know gave us an opportunity where when you look at far off places people you know would would you know would give arms and limbs just to have the opportunity to vote and here we take it for granted you know what i mean and and you know, like Lee said, you know, we became, you know, politically, you know, uh, involved, whether people realize it or not, even though we didn't have the right to push a button for a candidate or whatever. But, you know, we paid attention for years and years and years. And, you know, again, I just salivated and I got out. I'm out. And listen, I'm going to vote in every election. And I'm going to talk to people about the importance of voting. You know what I mean? I'm going to pride. I'm going to carouse. I'm going to, you know what I mean? I'm going to speak out, speak up, speak out. I'm going to do whatever I can to help people to realize that, you know, this right to vote is sacred and very important and is your duty. And don't take it for granted. I love to hear that. Uh, so, Jamila, I want to ask you, how can we as community members, if we're not part of the media, if we're not producers, if we're not storytellers, right, how can we help push these narratives and stories and try to help change uh, the current discussion and change even legislation? Well, I mean, it starts with your own vote, vote as well. Um, you could go speak to your legislators. I mean, I know that as individuals, if you if you want to, you can establish relationships with people who are incarcerated, mentor them. There's a lot of different ways to do this. But I do think like for Pennsylvania, because we are one of six states that um, has life without parole, I am personally interested in knowing like, what is the movement happening to change that? And what will it take? Like, I'd like to the Lieutenant Governor to tell us, you know, that is, uh, is it a, a change to our state constitution? Um, what will it take? Do we need like a referendum to do that? I know I, I've been working on another story about voter suppression in Florida, uh, where, where returning citizens there had, <clears throat> had to change their, their state constitution to regain their right to vote. Uh, Desmond Mead is now, you know, like a just won uh, an award for his uh, the work that he's done around that. I mean, we have the power within ourselves to change what we don't want to have happening to our own people. Um, and uh, that's what's beautiful about our country. There are vehicles and ways for us to fight for what is right and just, and we shouldn't give up. Um, so, uh, but I would like to hand it over to Lieutenant Governor to tell us like, what, what is the way to change that here for, in Pennsylvania? Sure. Um, the, the, the first way I believe to change it, and I believe there there could be political bipartisan buy into it, and, and that is eliminating the felony murder law, which condemned Lee and Dennis to die in prison. This idea that that someone sitting in the getaway car is equally culpable as somebody inside committing a crime uh, uh, and, and taking a life or doing something. It, it, you know, you will pay the ultimate penalty. And, you know, in Pennsylvania, because of how messed up that is, the individual that everyone acknowledges, the prosecutor, the shooter himself, all of those folks, you know, he got a third degree de uh, deal and was released in 2008. But they were going to die in prison on a pure technicality, even though everyone agrees they did not take a life. And I, that's not justice, you know. Justice is important. We must listen and embrace victims too. They, they, you know, as well. But, but that's that's simply not justice. And my office uh, partnered with Pulse, uh, Philadelphia Lawyers for Social Equity, to commission and and the Heinz Endowment uh, uh, out west here commissioned for a first of its kind study on who is doing life without parole for second degree murder. And it's a compelling snapshot of the state has uh, over 1160 men and women that are going to die in prison they will literally pay the ultimate penalty the same identical penalty as somebody who has maybe killed five six seven you know 10 11 people like the tree of life shooter when they never themselves never directly took a life um and actually had no idea that that was even going to happen the worst second degree case they're all terrible that we got a pardon for was he was he just turned 18 years old and he was sitting in a getaway car and his two accomplices were inside a bank in Dauphin County 
and tragically uh, uh, someone lost their life and he spent the next 52 years in prison, you know, as an, as a just turned 18 year old that had no idea that what was going to happen. And he applied for a commutation 14 times. And on the 15th time, that was the first case we ever did. I ever did as Lieutenant governor and he's out, you know, because he did like, how much is enough? It was so bad that even the district attorney of Dauphin County, which is not a, a, a hug, a hug, huggy, touchy, feely kind of jurisdiction. They're like, this person, this is not justice, you know? And, and uh, if we as a state could agree that second degree felony murder is wrong, life without parole is wrong for this conviction, that I believe can put us on the path to a more holistic approach where we balance the needs of justice and victims with the ultimate penalty. And, and that is, in my opinion, death and di or dying in prison. So that's one of the things that I want to leave as a legacy is, is that this body of work that clearly demonstrates that this is something that needs to change. Lee and Dennis can carry that on too as shining examples of, if you really think Pennsylvania should be spending $100,000 a year to, to warehouse these men for something that they didn't do, or, and you know, no one believes that they did, then um, th there's a lot of others and, and ways that we could, could change the system by eliminating that first and then working towards uh, murder one. You know, I'm also, I'm struck by the fact that um, while, you know, they did get out, they still have to prove their innocence. Like that has not happened, even with all of this remarkable work. And and what what's going to, what is that going to take? Um, the amount of time and energy um, for them to really, truly be free. I don't know. That's a great question. But what, what, what keeps me up at night is, is that, that the only way they would have avoided, they, they avoided dying in prison was passing through the board of pardons. The Pennsylvania constitution would have to change. Not, you know, the president of the United States couldn't issue a pardon, you know, this, yeah. this had to go through this board and, and, and there should be more paths to freedom as far as I'm concerned in, in those cases. And, and, and especially since, there's a well-documented history now of, of dubious convictions emerging from the district attorney's office in Philadelphia during that period, you know, and, you know, it's striking. It's, yes. Yeah. It's, it's a tragedy and, and it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And, and there's others too, you know, Naomi Blunt, who, who works on, 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 on my, uh, on my official side, that was another life that was thrown away forensically exonerated by a judge in 1985 of any involvement. And yet she languished in prison for decades longer and was originally rejected by a vote of zero to five just for even getting a hearing. You know, we must audit our lifer population and determine those that are suited and appropriate for 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 relief. And and uh, Lee and Dennis, uh, I, again, um, are the the finest example. You know, I, I, you literally had the entire prison behind them. The, the secretary of corrections on down, we're like, we're going to miss them. Jeez, <laughs> you know, that, that's saying a lot, you know, like we're going to miss them because they are an asset to our department of corrections. But they knew that they never belonged in there in the first place, but and they deserve to be back out. And they I could not find anyone, not one single person that was that, that said anything less than glowing things about these men. And, um, you know, I, uh, yeah, it's, uh, they're extraordinary people. And, and, uh, thank you, uh, for, for showcasing this, uh, in their story, because I, I believe they have an important, uh, story to tell for others and, and they can change hearts and minds. And real quick, I know we only have just a minute left. So as we begin to wrap up the program tonight, I just want to thank WNET one more time and each of our absolutely incredible panelists for lending their expertise and their time to this incredible conversation tonight. And please, everyone, watch the rest of the series. It's an incredible series. There's five ep episodes. And share it with your friends, your families, and your networks. 
The stories that they highlight in the series are so powerful. And Jamila, you did an incredible job on this project. So really, thank you so much. The power of a second chance is a fundamental belief of John's campaign. It's a large part of why John is running for Senate. And if you're interested in becoming a part of our incredible team of volunteers on the ground who are advocating for second chances, please text PARDON, that's P-A-R-D-O-N, to 30200, and we'll connect you directly with Dennis and Lee and the rest of the team, and everybody can get involved in helping to advocate and share these stories. So thank you all so much for joining. We hope to see you again. Good night.